This is a Wi-Fi enabled socket that was sent by David some time ago. I've lost the communication he originally sent, but I believe it was a, an unreliable device. It wasn't actually holding the connection properly. But the idea is that if I uh, cover this over so you can actually see the neon lamp here, when you press these buttons, you can toggle the output on and off. And you've got two of them. And there's uh, also two USB sockets and the illumination behind them. It uh, goes on and off with the sockets. Uh, power consumption of this unit, uh, if it's off, it doesn't even register at all in the hobby, which is quite good. It doesn't have a very high standby current. If it's on, which is just one of the relays enabled, it's about 0.7 watts. Uh, both of them on, it's 1.16 watts. Rough power factor, about 0.4. And it can also supply 2.1 amps at 5 volts. And I have tested that. It does supply the full 2.1 amps even when both the relays are active because I guess they are powered from the 5 volts as well. Let's open it up and take it to bits and see what's inside. Sure. I'm going to remove these wires that are disconnected now. And we shall unclip the cover and take a look. Now, I have an issue with people putting stuff in their houses like this because... Um, I am not a huge fan of electronics being built into the walls, particularly stuff that can fail uh, or have issues like this one's got relays in it. I'm not sure what current will be rated for the sockets, uh, but there always is a risk that, well, there's much higher risk of a fire with one of these than there is with a, a, standard, a standard socket. I think it's much better just to plug something into it, like a USB power supply, as opposed to actually having the electronics built into something that is effectively a fixed part of the wiring. So this has a, a clip-on cover. Let's see if we can get this off without stabbing myself. Uh, not that easy to get off. Oh, this is this is not easy to get off. I shall just use unreasonable force since I don't think this is going to be reused. Okay. Maybe I should have lifted it from the bottom. Uh, anyway, I took it out that way. Um, I'm guessing... Oh, I can see the tabs. This plate probably comes off. It does look like it's clipped in. I think this has been opened. Oh, get these, this cover off and we'll see what's inside. Excuse the loud popping, cracking noises. I take it this is the correct way to take this apart. Is there a screw hole in this? I don't see a screw hole yet. I think that's more or less it. Is there anything? Oh, there are screws in the back holding it. That would be helpful. Let us undo the screws. Finding a way in. Ugh. So there's the shutters that are over the sockets for the safety. Here are two small relays. Here's the transformer associated with the power supply. Oh, there's the little Wi-Fi module at the end there, just sticking up. Another thing about these is uh, when you actually recess it into a wall, if it's a stone wall and you're using a metal box like this in the wall, everything, you know, the ideal for me, the ideal Wi-Fi connectivity is going to be a box sitting out on a table or at least mounted just in the vicinity of a wall. But when you recess it into the wall, then all the sort of uh, RF reception circuitry is kind of screened in a way. Let's see if we can get this circuit board out. I can see a small screwdriver down there. I'm also wondering what these little uh, tabs at the back are for. Are they for test purposes? Oh, they, they appear to be the button contacts. Right, tell you what, give me one moment. I shall uh, work out how to get this circuit board out and we'll take a look at it. So, one moment, please. Okay. I have reverse engineered it. It's very modular. Let's go over all the bricks that build this thing together and take a look at how the, they've separated things electrically and where it may have fallen down a little bit. So the incoming supply comes on here and it goes to a fusible resistor about 3.3 ohm and a fuse. The fuse is going onto this bus bar track which is feeding these two relays. The relays have 5 volt DC coils. They're basically powered from the USB power supply and they switch to these two outputs. Uh, let's take a look at the low voltage side first, the power supply. So it goes through this fusible resistor. There is a metal oxide varistor here with no thermal protection, which is a bit naughty. The tiniest 47 nanofarad capacitor I've seen, and then I flip this over so this circuit board here is actually matched to this. So underneath this, you can see the two connections there is the bridge rectifier. That then goes to the first smoothing capacitor, which is this electrolytic capacitor here. 
Then there's an inductor here, which is hiding down here and to the next capacitor, and that is just sort of double layer filtering. That then goes to this chip here. This chip is a PN8370, and it's interesting that they've paired it up with another PN chip there. Uh, but this is a little switch mode power supply chip. Well, where is the schematic for that? Because uh, it's pretty much textbook. There's only one slight deviation. Oh, that's quite ferocious. I'll, I'll tame it down just a little bit just to, just to make it less ferocious. Uh, where is a suitable pointy object? Pointing object. Oh, I've misplaced my pen. There it is. Uh, that's incoming supply coming through the bridge rectifier. Uh, this is a abbreviated, this is a very much abbreviated schematic. Let's go to the more complex one. This this is better. This is a, this is more detailed. There's the rectifier. There's the metal oxide varistor, rectifier, the smoother capacitor, the inductor, and then the second smoother capacitor. And then that positive side feeds the coil. The coil is switched down to the negative uh, side of that capacitor with uh, through this chip and when it does it switches it uh, down it basically puts a magnetic field into the transformer and then once it reaches a sense current see uh, here cs current sense this resistor actually two resistors i'll show you in the circuit board afterwards when it reaches the current threshold, it turns off, and initially there's a bit of a spike. Uh, that spike is clipped through this diode charging that capacitor, uh, which then gets trickle charged with that resistor. The main thing is that that bit is just a snubber. If you look at the original simpler diagram, it just lists that as a snubber. Uh, in a way, I suppose actually, this is actually easier to look at. Let's look at let's look at the easier one. So the snubber, we've covered that. There's the primary winding. We have a bootstrap winding. The bootstrap winding, when the uh, charge is put in, magnetic field is put on, when this is turned off, current flows in the bootstrap winding and also the secondary winding into the capacitor. So it puts a magnetic field into the transform. When it turns off, that field collapses and then that's when it puts a pulse of energy out into the output. Uh, but it goes back via this diode. It also gets sensed via a little resistor bridge just so it can actually monitor the, the uh, voltage on the secondary. And uh, it also charges that capacitor there. And that capacitor is the bootstrap capacitor. I shall show you these things. There's the bootstrap capacitor down there. I shall brighten this up. Bootstrap capacitor down there being charged via this diode. The snubber network is this diode and these components here. There's the couple of sense resistors. There's only one slight deviation from the schematic. The feedback winding actually has a little capacitor across it for decoupling and stability. That's more or less it. There is a class Y capacitor, this blue one, for suppression purposes that connects the output. Uh, which side is that? I think that's the negative. It connects the negative to the uh, main side, and that's just to, uh, to suppress electrical interference is to provide a route of, for current back that is capacitively coupled between these windings. The windings, to get separation, to allow this fairly chunky separation here, which looks great in the circuit board, it's not so great once you get into the plastic switch plate. They have fly leads coming out, sleeved fly leads coming from the uh, transformer. I'm not sure what separation is like without actually unwinding the transformer. I'm not sure how good the separation is, but at least that's a, a decent start. That then goes over to this chip here, which is a PN8306M. Not a lot to say about that. It's got a little bit of decoupling circuitry in the vicinity. The main thing is that the, that component there is an active rectifier. Instead of having being a diode with a significant voltage drop that causes heat. This is a MOSFET and it's got the circuitry built in that it can detect when it, the unit is putting that pulse of energy out to charge capacitors and it turns the MOSFET hard on. It means it's got a very low on state resistance. It means there's very low losses. It's basically just a much simpler, it's like an active diode if you will. So that charges up these two capacitors here that are in parallel, and that supplies the 5 volts to the two USB sockets, but it also supplies the 5 volts to the little receiver circuitry here uh, via this voltage regulator. I did test this. It was capable of sustaining its uh, full current, which is quite good. Um, so going over to this little edge 
connector here with the programming pins, that's where you can load your malware in onto it if you were so inclined. Uh, that is basically, this uh, module sits down and solders through the circuit board and it's a, uh, turn it the right way around, ESP8285. It's a standard, it's a built a microcontroller with built-in Wi-Fi uh, circuitry. So it simplifies everything greatly. It looks like it's designed to have external memory added to it, but they've not used that. They've just written a bit of software, simple software inside. And that's the bit that monitors not only the switches on the front, these clicky switches, which are repurposed. This switch plate has been a standard click on, click off switch plate, and they've adapted it. Whereas the live comes in here, and would normally have gone to those two contacts and it would have just basically come in, fanned out, and then when these were switched over, the other side of it would have then uh, gone to the both the live pins independently. What they've actually done here, they've adapted it, so they've made it moment traction, and they've run a couple of wires over, three wires to be precise, looping to the common with that little thin wire that just rams down next to the neutral bus bar there, which I don't actually care much for, particularly if Polarity gets swapped accidentally on the circuit, because that's quite thin wire and it's kind of wedged in. But uh, that has a couple of contacts that are normally closed, and when you click it, it opens those contacts. It's just presumably the way it worked. But um, the separation between the low-voltage side in there is not great. Particularly given that this uh, connector, if you had a bad connection and it started melting and moving, as sometimes they do, it's very close to these little low-voltage contacts. I don't really care much for that. That's where the separation of the unit kind of gets ruined. If anything, it would have been nice if they'd just maybe added a couple little buttons down here, little tactile buttons, or even put an auxiliary circuit board in there that uh, had the fly wires going off and uh, just a little clicky tactile buttons. But instead, they've opted to use this, probably just for economy reasons, so they could reuse an existing switch that had the facility for, presumably, I'm going to guess that this was a dual switch with a Wi-Fi repeater in it or something like that, but they've repurposed it with the, uh, with the uh, receiver, the uh, ESP8285. So the 5 volts coming across, the voltage regulator feeds that circuitry. The circuitry then monitors those switch inputs via this little connector here, uh, this connector here, and uh, some resistors. And it also has a couple of uh, decoupling capacitors in the vicinity of that regulator for stability. Uh, and it's got two transistors. One transistor here, they're MOSFETs, uh, 2N7002, I think. Uh, so they've got a 10k resistor associated with each one, pulling it down to the zero volt rail to keep it turned off. And then they've got a 1k resistor to turn the MOSFET on. So there's one there and there's one there. They have a back EMF diode for each of those. This one's back EMF diode is over here. And the three LEDs, when it turns the relay on, the two outer blue LEDs are switched on via these resistors uh, by the same transistor that's switching uh, the winding. So this transistor here and this back EMF diode deals this relay. Um, and this one deals via this little track here. It deals with that relay. The relays are 5 volt uh, coil rated about, depending on the standard, 10 amps or 15 amps. Wouldn't really trust it for a very high current. There is no thermal protection if these relays, the contacts start melting in them. They've not, there's not enough room in this thing for protection for, they've just crammed so much into a small space. This uh, white LED, I can see the phosphor here, is controlled directly from one pin on the little ESP receiver. Um, what else more is there to say? I don't really think there's much else more to say about this. Um, I would have to actually remove the transformer and unwind it. Should I do that? And we'll take a look and see what the separation is. I think I will do that. I'll desolder this transformer and I'll uh, take some uh, of the, the tape off and we'll take a look and see what the separation is like. One moment, please. Okay, let's see if we can unwind this. Now I've removed the transformer, so I'll make a little slit in the tape around the outside and we'll try and peel this off. Things worthy of note about these things, if the processor crashes, your socket will be rendered 
unusable. You won't be able to turn it on or off or anything. It might just crash in a locked state of the last known uh, operational state. The only way you could reset that is either by turning the power off at the distribution board to reset the socket or by doing something absolutely terrible. If, if it was something that you couldn't really do that, you could theoretically uh, make a little USB plug with a low value resistor across it and deliberately put it in very briefly and it would bridge the five volts and uh, drag the voltage down low enough to hopefully cause the processor to reset. I'm not a huge fan of, uh, I've mentioned this before, of active electronics and processors and stuff like that. Ooh, what's that little, uh, there's a little wire tucked under there. That'll be a something, I, is that to deal with interference by pressing it against the ferrite? Or is that just a tail, a, a rogue tail that got trapped during manufacture? It's hard to say. Uh, if you were to have one of these sockets fail, if the power supply in it blew up, you could still theoretically use it. The If you just basically chopped off the bit that had gone boom, the mains voltage side bit here, you could still use this module by tacking uh, a couple of connections across these smoothing capacitors here, and you could run it from a 5-volt supply like a power bank. That would, technically speaking, give you a standalone switch unit. Do they exist? I guess there must be 5-volt modules for uh, for switching. Could be useful for stage or use. Not really sure. Uh, am I going to be able to get this chunk here so I've not got sharp... No, it's not really want to come out. Right, tell you what, I'll just leave that in then. Let's carefully explore these uh, windings. I'll take a little bit more of this off, if I can. I shall abuse my side cutters to, to nibble at ceramic, which is a terrible thing to do because ceramic versus steel, uh, ceramic usually wins. Maybe I'll just use pliers for that. And I'll just use crushing force. Oh, crunchy, crunchy. Radio. I'll zoom down this a little bit, but not too much. Um, right, where is the end of the winding, the tape here? Here is the end of the tape. Let's carefully peel it off and try not destroy the evidence in the process. So I'm expecting an outer winding first as part of the feedback winding. What are we going to get? Okay, it's kind of, it's come to a sticky end and it's not wanting to unwrap anymore. So that's it. All right, okay, here we go, here we go. So this is, it looks like double insulated wire. It is, it's double insulated wire. So even though it's wound right down over those connections, it does have the thicker insulation suggesting it is okay. I mean, I hate these little transformers. It's interesting that the secondary is actually wound in the outside here. Uh, so the sense winding must be uh, the next layer, I'd guess. And they've just, they've not done that thing that they wind it over the top and underneath and over the uh, the secondary. Look, that is the secondary. Look how long it is. Let's just measure that. The whole winding, the whole... 5 volt, 2.1 amp or 2.5 amp, if you allow a bit more for the other stuff, is uh, 200 millimeters long uh, or 8 inch. And it's actually, they've used two bits of wire uh, to spread the load across that. And it is that, it's that thicker insulation. Which is just as well, really, because it does run directly over uh, these connections down here. But it's not that bad because they are tucked well in. So although it just brushes against them, it's not really too dramatic. Let's go a little tiny bit further here. I'm wondering uh, what applications you'd have where if that was crashing repeatedly. Uh, one of the things I hear a lot about these things is that they just drop off the network. They just basically... I wonder if they're actually crashing or they're just glitching and the software is just losing the network. It may be that it helped by the fact that uh, if because they're built into the switch plate, the actual socket plate, if they're put into a stone wall with that metal back box, that is going to have a major screening effect. That little wire there, 
Oh no, it's not. That is the, the sense winding. That is just the... So after that, it'll be just be the primary ones there. So that's more or less it. it, it the transformer's not bad. It's okay. I think it would have withstood a high voltage test. Um, yeah, the fact this is built into the box, and if you put it in a plasterboard wall in a plastic box, there's a good chance that it would have decent reception. But uh, if it was mounted in a traditional... If it was a stone wall with the metal box, I think uh, you might end up just not getting... Uh, good, reliable Wi-Fi connectivity in that because you're relying on this little module that is recessed. It's tucked right in there. It's uh, right in here, just right up against the metal box and this stone surrounding it, so that could affect it. So uh, maybe for modern buildings with flimsier building materials. I wonder uh, what the rating of that fuse is. I wonder if it's actually written on it. Let's see if we can snip that fuse out. I wish I hadn't turned the soldier iron off now. Um, I shall... Wiggle it until it busts. Let's destroy it completely. It is busted. Let's uh, take a magnifying glass and see if I can see any current rating in this. It's a glass fuse. If there was a short circuit, it wouldn't fare very well against the 32 amp circuit breaker. It says... Oh, it is. It's rated. This tiny little fuse is rated 16 amps. Oh. That's a very small 16 amp fuse. That's a pinky size 16 amp fuse with glass so that, you know, in the event of it failing, it would probably just go black and sooty and it would just probably pop and explode. Um, yeah, strange. It's a strange mix. It's got, it's got the, they've made an attempt to get decent separation, but it's just uh, fallen down with those uh, very close contacts and the sort of leading to the low voltage side. And uh, things like the protection is just a little bit lacking just because there wasn't enough space to actually really add too much in. But there we go. It was certainly worth taking apart. It was very interesting uh, how they cram so much active electronics into things that shouldn't have active electronics in them. But as I've said, my own preference is just to use an ordinary socket on the wall and actually just plug, say for instance, if you want a a Wi-Fi controlled socket, just plug a Wi-Fi controlled socket in. If you need a USB charger, plug a USB charger in, because that way when they fail, you can just unplug them and you can change them. But uh, certainly, this was well worth taking to bits anyway. It was quite interesting.